Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. Judges 6, starting at verse 33. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet. And the Abizrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool in the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, just as you've said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung out enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them. I will test them for you there. And anyone of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone of whom I say to you, This one shall not go with you, shall not go with you. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was three hundred men. But all of the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men who lapped, I will save you, and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go, every man to his own home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. And they sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, Go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands will, shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance." When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian. And all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. 
And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. And when they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah toward Zerarah as far as the border of abel Mohola, but by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from, on, from all Manasseh, and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them, as far as beth Barah and also the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were called out, and they captured the waters as far as beth Barah and also the Jordan. And they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeeb they killed at the winepress of Zeeb. Then they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeeb to Gideon across the Jordan. This is the word of the Lord. Still here? Sometimes I wonder if I put my head down and read, you all might leave and I'll look up and I'll be here by myself. The main point I want to draw out of this passage for you this morning, the main point that I think the writer of Judges is getting across, I think he does it marvelously, I think he does it clearly, and it's my hope and prayer that I'll be able to do the same for you. The main point is this, God's grace greets Gideon at every gate. God's grace greets Gideon at every gate. People often confuse grace and mercy. Familiar with this? If I were to ask you what's the difference between grace and mercy, you might stumble and have a little difficulty. Let me me try to help you a little bit. Mercy is God's kind posture toward us that doesn't punish us when we deserve it. This is mercy. Grace, on the other hand, is God's kind action to work in us what we cannot do on our own. Do you understand? Mercy is God's kindness saying, I'm going to leave you alone. And us being thankful for that, right? Ooh, thank you for that mercy. Grace is God moving toward us to help us in such a way that we are helped And we increase in joy and we increase in thankfulness because God was gracious toward us. As we walk through this passage, I want you to see the gates. I want you to see the walls or the barriers that keep Gideon from going forward. And every one of them opened by God's kind help, his grace. Not his mercy, but his grace. Helping, supporting, strengthening Gideon. God's grace to Gideon overcomes every weakness and inability that Gideon encounters. Okay, first let's look at this section beginning in verse 33 of chapter 6. And we see there that grace gathers an army. Grace gathers an army. In verses 33 through 35, we see the great and terrible army that was defeated that has defeated Israel for every year for the last seven years. This great and terrible army has crossed into Israel's territory by crossing over the Jordan, and they're poised to pillage their way through the land one more time. 
If you missed that last week when we talked about it, we talked about how Israel was hiding. Israel was everywhere. They just waited for these people to come in and wreck stuff. And it was like they build a society, they build a tower, and then every year, at least once a year, these people would come through and just knock it all over. They were hiding, they were terrified, and life was no fun. We're told in chapter 7, beginning at verse 12, that this army, quote, lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. Do you, do you get a little feel for that? Okay, I, we, I think of locusts or I think of grasshoppers and I think, oh, there's one. Okay, but the idea that's being um, communicated here when it's talking about locusts without number, or locusts in abundance, they're talking about locusts that come in and eat everything. They cover stuff. Because I got young boys, young boys, have you ever seen a uh, fish that's been pulled out of water and left on the shore for a while, covered in maggots? Gross, nasty, but insects, critters coming along to destroy, okay? These insects don't know anything about personal space. They're rubbing up against each other. All they care about is being there in full force to devour. And this is the kind of language that's being used to speak of this army that God has called Gideon to go up against. Yet, do you see in verse 34, right? One of my favorite words in the Bible is but. Okay, now, before we giggle too far, what does it say in verse 34? This great army had come. They had entered the entryway of their home. And it says, but the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. But the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. And Gideon sounded the trumpet. The locusts have come. The bad guys have come. They're everywhere. But Gideon, empowered by the Holy Spirit, sounds a trumpet. He doesn't run and hide. He sounds a trumpet. And as Gideon is empowered to stand up to this great army instead of hiding from them, we also see that other Israelites are also empowered. We see that the Abizrites... You remember anything about the Abizrites last week? The Abizrites were Gideon's own clan, and the last time we talked about them, they wanted to kill Gideon. By the work of the Lord in this situation, the Spirit's empowerment, those who wanted to kill Gideon had now lined up and ready to follow him. Not only was it his, his clan, but it was his tribe, the tribe of Manasseh, the tribes of Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. A whole bunch of people had come out of hiding and were ready to fight. A lot is being communicated by the presence of the Spirit in this passage. What you and I need to see here is that God's grace to Gideon gave him the Holy Spirit to empower him to stand and fight where he had previously cowered in fear. Do you remember when we met Gideon? Where was young Gideon? Gideon was hiding in a wine press. He was trying to get groceries in a hidden grocery store because he was afraid of the Midianites who were going to come and take his food. Gideon was a frightened man, dominated by fear, and not unnecessarily. This whole land was covered in fear, but the spirit came, and now Gideon is blowing a trumpet, and he's leading an army. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And what does it do? Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. It's very common for people to misunderstand grace. God's grace does not come to us and say, Oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Many people think of God as a gracious God, like some sort of librarian that has a never-ending grace period on your book that just doesn't seem to make it home. But this is not grace. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation, teaching us, retraining us to renounce ungodliness. The grace of God is a power to fight. It is a power to fight sin. You and I are not tormented by Midianites. At least not today. 
But we're tormented by many other things, aren't we? We have many other enemies everywhere we turn, but the grace of God as it empowers Gideon to fight, it empowers you and I as Christians to fight sin. Grace empowers us to resist God's enemies, those enemies that want us to worship them instead of God. Romans 8, 12, speaking of the Spirit, says this, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. We see here that every Christian is given the Spirit, such like Gideon. And by the Spirit, we live lives of putting sin to death. What I need you all to understand and what I want more and more and more Americans to understand is that a Christian is not someone who simply says they're a Christian. You can mark whatever box you want on some sort of census or some sort of survey. You can type Christian into your Facebook profile or any other profile. You can tell your family you're a Christian What matters is whether God says you're a Christian. And what the scriptures say is that every Christian has the Spirit. Gideon is unique. He's been empowered by the Spirit. And just like Gideon, every single true Christian has been given the Spirit. And this Spirit causes us to be fighters Not fighters with pastors or fighters with family members, but fighters with sin. We need to see that those who claim to be Christians but show no signs of self-control or of putting to death the deeds of the sinful flesh are claiming to have a spirit and claiming to have a grace that is simply a figment of their imagination. If that spirit... If that grace is not working repentance and warring against that sin, that person is not saved and needs to turn to Jesus for salvation. Now, I don't want to just say that as true. I don't just want to say that boldly as hard truth. But I want to say that as a man who's grieved. Because I know a lot of people who say they're a Christian. And they're sleeping this morning because they're hungover. Or they're at the beach this morning because worship isn't important to them. Or they're living lives as hypocrites. But friend, whether you're in this room or you're hearing my voice or you get this message through one of you, if your life is not marked by the power of the Spirit and the grace of God fighting against sin, you're not a Christian. I don't say that to shame you, but I say that to wake you up and I pray that you would become a Christian. Scriptures tell of God separating sheep from goats at the judgment and that there will be many who will stand before Jesus and Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And I don't think it's just the AC that gives me goosebumps when I think about people who are going to be so flabbergasted because they spent their lives telling people that they're Christians, and then when they stand before Jesus, he's going to say, I never knew you. You didn't have my spirit. I didn't give you my grace. You didn't fight sin. You just told people you were a Christian. If that's you this morning, come see me. I love you, and I don't want you to stand before Jesus and be surprised. I don't want you to be deceived by the evil one, thinking you're a Christian when you're not. What you and I need to be reminded of and encouraged as genuine Christians is that if you are a Christian, you have the power of God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit resting on you to put to death the sins of idolatry, those sins that ruin your joy, those sins that mess up your intimacy with God. I'm concerned about people who call themselves Christians and don't have the Spirit. I'm also for Christians who have the Spirit and aren't thrilled by it. 
Christians who have the Spirit of God resting on them, and they don't have hope. They think they're just going to be stuck in sin forever. They think they're just going to, they're confined to depressed lives for the rest of their life. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you will have victory. You have power. You have God's grace. You have God's help to obey. You have God's grace to enjoy Him in this life. Do you hear me? If you have the Spirit of God, there is a dramatic change in who you were to who you are. There is a dramatic change in what you could have expected of yourself then and what you can expect of yourself now. Friend, if you have the grace of God, you have power. If you have the Spirit of God, you have hope. The Holy Spirit and the grace of God empowered Gideon to stand against his enemies. And it helps every Christian live a life of war against the forces of evil. But that's not all. Let's look at verse 36 and that section moving through verse 40. Second thing we see about God's grace is that God's grace is greater than doubt. In verses 36 through 40, Gideon tests God's power and God's command by laying out a fleece of wool on two different nights, whereby God is to show his power and presence by causing the fleece to be supernaturally separate from its surroundings. In giving this test to God, Gideon says, Then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you've said. This test reveals that Gideon knows what God has promised. He says, As you've said, this test reveals he knows what God has said, but he is still afraid and he's still weak in faith. He's aware of the promises God has made. But his ability to grasp them and live by faith in them is very weak, and so he tests God. Though Gideon has been clothed with the Spirit, it does not mean he ceases to be the weak and frightened Gideon he's always been. Same is true for you. Because you've been given the Spirit, you have a hope, you have a power. Because God's grace rests on you, you have help. But that doesn't mean you magically cease being who you've always been. It doesn't mean a person who struggles with fear becomes a Christian never struggles with fear. The grace of God and the Spirit of God give us a power and a posture that rightly identifies us as new creations. Yet we are not the perfect and glorified creations God will make us in the new heavens and the new earth. Like Gideon, we are clothed with the Spirit, yet our faith is mixed with doubt and our fighting sin is mixed with fear. Is anybody else encouraged that Gideon got the Spirit and still wasn't all that impressive? I'm not much for talking myself up into the mirror, but you can, you can know what I'm talking about in this sort of situation. Where you can encourage yourself in the gospel and say, Drew, you have the Spirit you have the grace of God. You have power. Why do you keep stumbling like this? Yet at the same time, there's this encouragement. I'm not who I'm going to be. I'm still who I was, but by the grace of God, I'm not who I was. I'm becoming, I'm being made new. And just like Gideon, we can be clothed with the Spirit and still struggle. The second thing I want you to see in verses 36 through 40 is not only that Gideon still struggles, but what, what is God's response? We see in this section that God patiently and tenderly meets Gideon in his weakness. In verse 39, Gideon says, let not your anger burn against me. And we see here that Gideon's fleeces are not some sort of smart way of getting God to show us what to do. I remember being in one uh, church council meeting and people were trying to figure out whether or not we should take on debt to do this building and there were just hard decisions and the group was kind of split on what to do. And one woman said, well, let's put out a fleece. <laughs> or something like that. 
And I remember being struck by that and thinking, okay, that's a very biblical response, isn't it? But is that the way we should interpret Gideon's fleeces? Gideon's fleeces are proof of his weak faith. But they're also proof that God meets him where he is and gives them the grace he needed in that moment to keep trusting and keep moving forward with his weak legs of faith. I wouldn't encourage you to put out fleeces and make God jump through hoops to get you to do what he's called you to do. But you do need to understand that your weak faith is no match for God and God is tender and God is patient and he will come to you and give you the grace to keep moving forward in your weak faith. Every Christian wants to have faith that says to God, I know what you've promised and I believe it wholeheartedly and without the slightest reservation. Anybody else want to be that way? I read it. All I need to do is believe it, and I believe it wholeheartedly, God. That just isn't the truth, is it? Like Gideon, we don't have faith like that. We have weak and shaky faith. We have the kind of faith that forgets the promises of God. Some of us can recite the promises of God word for word from memory, yet our ability to act and rest in these promises is far from impressive. Can you relate to Gideon? In Gideon's fleeces, we see God's grace that is greater than Gideon's weak faith. And in Gideon's fleeces, we see, what did I say? In, in Gideon's fleeces, mm, in Gideon's fleeces, we see that God's grace is greater than our weak faith. Let's look now at this grace that is glorified in weakness. Specifically, looking at chapter 7 and the first eight verses. In the first eight verses of chapter 7, Gideon and his armies, these armies of Israel, are gathered together at 32,000 strong. And in verse 2, God says to Gideon, What does he say? The people with you are too many. I hope you're awake enough to be at least a little bit stunned by these words. God says your army is too big. This is like me coming home and my wife saying, honey, we've got way too much money in the bank. (laughs) Or you are way too good looking. There are certain things you can't have too much of, right? But God comes to Gideon and says, you've got a big old army. It's too big. You need to let some of these guys go. Now again, let me just stop and pause for a minute. The life of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is going to give you moment after moment after moment after moment where you respond to the voice of the Lord and you're going to say, what did you just say? Why is my life going this way? That's the way God does stuff. Be familiar with it. It's clear over and over and over and over. Our God is the kind of God who says, your army's too big. You have too much money in your bank account. You're too good looking. Right? This is the kind of God that we have. 22,000 soldiers withdraw because of fear. That leaves 10,000 remaining, and it's still too many for God. And so a drinking exam, a test to be taken up at the water fountains, begins. This section, I've read it, and I've read it, and I've read it, and I've read it. It's still hard for me to visualize exactly who's drinking how and what. I just get so turned around. I I can't figure out exactly what's going on with this drinking exam. Uh, But the commentators are split on this. Some commentators will see something in the way that these 300 drink to say that these are the exceptional, these are the best guys. But I think what's wise and best is to see this section in light of verse 2 where God says, your people are too many. Why? 
Because I don't want your armies to boast and say that you got this. So I don't think it's wise or best to see these 300 as somehow the most vigilant or the best soldiers, right? It seems wisest to me to side with those commentators who say things like this. The water drinking episode was simply Yahweh's mechanism for further reducing Gideon's army. God is raising up a meek and weakened army that would be enabled to glorify God instead of taking credit to themselves. I think it, you could see this as simple as send these people out to pick flowers. Right? If they come back with a yellow one, put them in one section. If they come back with a white one, put them in another section. The, the guys who came back with white flowers was the smallest group, and the Lord says, that's my group. Okay, I don't know that there's anything, I don't see anything specific in this drinking thing. I just think that there's, this is a way that God separates and he brings about to himself a small little army. Now those of you who are good with math, uh, that is not me, but 300 is a small number compared to 32,000, correct? A fraction, a single digit percentage I think I read one commentator who said the, the army has been reduced by 99%. That is a remarkable reduction. Huge. And what I want you to see here is that God intentionally weakens his servants so that the glorious salvation that only God provides will not be mistaken for something that human beings have achieved in their own strength. Listen to the testimony of what the scriptures say elsewhere. Do you remember Jonah? Kids, do you remember Jonah? The prophet that disobeyed God and got swallowed? Jonah says this from the belly of a great fish. In his absolute powerlessness, Jonah said, salvation belongs to the Lord. Ephesians 2, the apostle Paul writes, by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Salvation is not the result of your working. Why? So that you have nothing to boast about. Brothers and sisters, your ability to make yourself right with God, humans, human beings' ability to get right with God is as effective as it is for Jonah to get out of a fish. Jonah knew his only hope of salvation is that if the Lord did it. Your only hope to be made right with God is if God does it. Every one of us is absolutely powerless to be made right with God apart from God doing it in his own strength and not yours. And God's reason for our salvation to be that way is so that God would get the glory. God's glory is sure and eternal. God's glory was true and unshaken before he created anything. And for us to understand anything about what's true and eternal and good is to understand that God's glory is the best, most unshakable, the best thing there is. And so for us to try to save ourselves or to believe that we can be saved by doing good things is to muddy the waters and to hide the reality that God's glory is eternal and that salvation can only come from God. And so for those of you, kids, I'm really concerned for you because so many of you have good parents who understand how important it is for you to be in church and how important it is for you to be far away from bad movies or bad influences and these kinds of things. And every one of you is going to be tempted to look at yourself and say, I'm a pretty good person. I'm a godly kid. God's lucky to have somebody like me who didn't mess up his life doing all those bad things. But understand, your good works, all of your going to church, all of your memorizing Bible verses and catechisms, it's not good enough. You need to look to God to save you. Your salvation, whether you're a good little church kid or not, you need God to save you. 
The New Testament also goes to great length to show that God is particularly pleased to call weak ones and to weaken strong ones so that his glory, the glory that is greater than idols, the glory that keeps us from the foolishness of idolatry might be broadcasted and embraced. I'm just going to fire off a couple of passages to you because I need to move. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 27 through 31 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 11, talks about having treasure in jars of clay to show that their surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. But I want to land on this one verse. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 is so helpful. Paul has a thorn, and God says, I'm not going to take your thorn away. Paul says, but God, but Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Hear these words. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Why? For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Hear me, brother and sister, your weakness is not a liability. Your weakness, your weaknesses are not an accident. Not only do your weaknesses not inhibit God's saving and acting power, but your weaknesses magnify God's glorious power and grace. So often in the church or the church culture, we, we, we love to boast in our own strength. We love to say, oh, I can do this, or I read that, or I did this, or I did that. But brothers and sisters, it is our weaknesses that magnify and project and broadcast God's saving grace to the world. Your weakness is not a liability. God is not wringing his hands and saying, man, I wish your immune system was stronger. God doesn't look at you and say, when are you going to stop stuttering? When are you going to get bold? When are you going to get... No, your weakness is there on purpose. God has given you weaknesses so that his grace would shine through you more clear than it would if you didn't stutter. And if your immune system was perfect. Let me just say, this needs to get in your head so that you can love yourself the way God intended. And for you to understand in your relationship with God is supposed to be. But this is also needs to get in your head so you can do life in this church right. Because everybody else in here is weak and they're going to let you down. And if you have expectations of people not being weak, your expectations are higher than God's. And you're going to be frustrated But to be a healthy church, we have to forgive one another. We have to be patient with one another and understand that God makes us weak for his own glory. Let's look now at this section beginning in verse 9 through 18. There we'll see that God's grace is greater than fear. In verses 9 through 18, preparations for battle are being made. God tells Gideon to go down against the camp. And in verse 9, in in verse 9, he tells him to go down against the camp. And in verse 10, this remarkable phrase exits the mouth of God. Okay? This phrase, this beautiful, poetic, encouraging, helpful phrase comes from God. God says to Gideon, not get down there and whoop them. He says, go down against the camp. But... If you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward, your hands will be strengthened. Gideon eavesdrops into a conversation between two soldiers who are two, two of an innumerable mass. And Gideon hears them recite a dream and interpret it to be the prophecy of their own doom, their own destruction. These guys are like locusts. These guys are like pebbles of sand on the seashore, and they're afraid because of a dream that God sent and an interpretation that they took. 
Gideon is rightly encouraged by this gracious help from God, and he fears, and his fears are further chased away so that Gideon's weak faith could obey God's command and bring about God's glorious salvation. Hear these words from one commentator. Fearlessness for most people is not a weakness that can be conquered once and for all. Instead, it's something that must be resisted and overcome again and again. Fear, uh, fear is something that afflicts, fear is not something that afflicts lesser mortals only. The permission given to Gideon to take Purah, his assistant, with him is reminiscent of the permission Moses was given to take Aaron in Exodus 4. It is a reminder that the one indispensable requirement for a leader of God's people is not fearlessness, but obedience. As I'm, as I'm reading this passage, it's about getting Gideon to war. But the way this passage moves is like me learning to drive stick this, this year. It's kind of herky-jerky. It gets going, but then it stops and says, we've got to deal with Gideon's doubt. And then it gets going, and then it's, we've got to deal with God's desire to show his glory through weakness. And then it gets going, but we've got to send Gideon down to get more grace so that his hands would be strengthened. Do you see all these starts and stops as God giving grace, as Gideon bumps into these gates, these, these stops, these speed bumps, and God gives grace to help him keep going? Hear me. God is not impatient. Did you hear me? God is not like you. God is not impatient. He's not easily frustrated by your weaknesses and your fears. So many of you will complain like I do. Man, parenting's hard. Why? Because I'm impatient with the weaknesses and the fears and the distraction of these kids. God's not that way. The scriptures tell us that God is slow to anger. Slow to anger. And his steadfast love is abounding. Psalm 103 tells us, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. I was thinking back over the course of my life. I do this from time to time. And I'm thankful that God gave me parents who took me to church week in and week out. Right? Some of you might look at me and say, Drew, you're here because you get paid to be here. That ain't fair. Well, listen. I would be in church if I was paid or not. Why? Because like Gideon, I need to be reminded over and over and over and over. I need to hear the word preached. I need to, to see the bread and I need to see the cup and I need to hear someone say, his blood covers your sin. And I don't know about you, but a week is too long. If I go two or three days without reading my Bible, oh man, I'm so discouraged and I need grace and I need help. But just like Gideon, God gives grace over and over and over and over and over again. And I just want to say to you, if your life isn't marked by a quickly rep repeating cycle of getting encouragement from the scriptures, of getting encouragement from God's word, of getting encouragement from the church and from God's people, you're in a bad spot. And you may not feel it now, but you're on a way to a worse spot. You need to be reminded. You need grace over and over and over again. Just like me. Now God gives grace repeated over and over. And lastly, I want to look at verses 17 through 25 and see that God's grace is greater than the enemy. Verses 19 through 25, the grace of God that has called and carried Gideon through every challenge here equips him with a wise plan to surprise, frighten, and confuse this army of Easterners. This minuscule army of 300 armed to the teeth soldiers, armed to the teeth with flashlights, clay pots, and band instruments, create a middle of the night chaos that God uses to turn Midian's great numbers against themselves. 
comrades slaughter one another while Gideon's band cheers them on from the sidelines. This initial slaughter then becomes a chase as Midianites and Amalekites run for their lives. And the once frightened Israelites, that 22,000 that left because they're afraid, these guys are now literally coming out of the woodwork and holes in the ground to continue enacting the salvation of the Lord. Verse 25 tells us that the enemy princes, Oreb and Zeb, are beheaded at a rock and a wine press. And this reminds us how far God has brought Gideon. Because when we first saw Gideon, he was on a wine press threshing fleet, threshing wheat. And he debated with an angel at a rock. And do you see how that's gone false, full circle? Now the enemy is dead at a wine press and dead at a rock. In Gideon's victory, you and I need to see that this salvation clearly belongs to the Lord. The band and the cheerleaders brought about victory. That's not the way sports work. That's not the way that's not the way war works, but that's the way it works when the grace of God is at in play. That which held Israel in slavery and constant fear was overcome by God's grace at work. We need to see in this salvation that God is able to provide freedom from humanity's slavery to sin and constant fear of death. That's where they lived, isn't it? They were enslaved. They were free. They had their own caves. But they lived in constant fear of death. In Gideon, we can clearly see a judge who saved his people from the Midianites. But we also need to see in Gideon a shadow. A shadow points to a salvation that would come through Jesus alone who defeats the greatest enemy with no weapon but a Roman cross and an empty tomb. While Gideon's trumpet-blowing army dealt a shameful loss to his enemies. Imagine how much shame was there for the Midianites. How did it all go today, guys? I don't know, some people woke me up in the middle of the night and, like, everybody's dead. (laughs) So loud. Did they have weapons? Like, every one of them had a trumpet. That's a shameful story to tell, isn't it? But listen to these words about Jesus Christ from Colossians 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now hear this. God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. God has put the Christian's enemies to shame by going to the cross. Kids, you have an enemy. It may not feel like that, but your only hope is in Jesus. Will you look to him? Friends, those of you who aren't Christians this morning, whether you're here or you're listening online or something, you have an enemy. The fear of death and damnation hangs over you. Will you run to Jesus and find your only hope in him? Or will you be busy? Or will you look somewhere else? Brothers and sisters, are you encouraged that you know Christ who has no trouble with the things that frighten you? Will you, like Gideon, trust God to save you beyond the strength of your body, beyond the strength of your will, or even the strength of your own imagination? Who could have imagined a victory like that? Will you follow Jesus and trust him to give you the grace to keep trusting him? Will you leave this room trusting that Jesus will give you grace day in and day out, just enough to keep you moving forward? If you are in Christ, hear this good word from the scriptures. God's grace will greet you at every gate. Let's pray. 